So next up, we have Hans Wu, uh, third year at UBC Medical School now. Um, but I've actually asked him to talk a little bit about um, dietary stuff, supplements. Um, and I think it goes back more than three years for you researching. This Way thing, more. Right? Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. When, so I'll let you tell. Yeah. Okay, but, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, he's, uh, very excited to, to hear what he has to say for us today on this topic. It's not because it's super long. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, my name is Hans. Luke found me on a forum on <laughs> Wine City. <laughs> uh, I've been into life extension for, I'm 25 right now, for over 10 years. So in the beginning, when I was an undergrad, we didn't have stuff like UBC Life Extension and stuff like that, so I never got involved. But I've been online for a long time. And in the beginning, what I found was there's a Google group called, no, Yahoo group called Psy Life, Psy Life Extension. And on that forum was Aubrey de Grey and Michael Range, who mentioned. And he practices Calvary's Church. So I'm just going to give you a broad overview of what my diet and my supplement regimen is like nowadays. And the point of this is so that hopefully you won't have to have to use cryonics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no, no. Uh, the extremes of like extension would be calorie restriction, but that's kind of extreme. So this is kind of a stepping stone to if you want to do calorie restriction, you would have to go through this process first. Right. So. Uh, so I'm going to first start with theor theoretical life expectancy. So nowadays, life expectancy for the Western world is around 75 for males. Uh, over 75 for females, they tend to live two to three years longer. And I was wondering if there was any limits to life expectancy. And in uh, 1991, some researchers used the life tables from insurance companies, and they took all the data, took these 13 points, and then determine if you optimize these points, how long could the average human being live? <coughs> so they did all this. In the United States, the life expectancy in 1986 was around 73. And as you can see in Alameda, the California group, their life expectancy is 100. And if you look at Mormon high priest with healthy practices, it was 90. Okinawa at the time wasn't that high. So you can see that among groups within the human population, we do have the capability to lift up to 100 years old. So if you were to implement healthy practices with somewhat healthy genetics, you could expect to live 100 years old. And this is average, right? So it's not like everybody reaches 100 and dies. There's people that live beyond 100. Next slide. And this is in females, and females live longer. Next slide. And so what we've seen over the last 100 years, uh, 300 years ago, you would live till 33, 45 years old and die. Nowadays, we live to 75. And what's been happening is, so this is like, X5 is if you, at what age, you will expect to live five more years. X10 is at what age you would expect to live 10 more years. And what you see is the gap between X5 and X10 has been similar. So you haven't been dying quicker. You've only been moving the causes of death farther into the future. Next slide. So what you see is today, this is our life expectancy. What's been happening is we've been moving the dying process farther into the future. If we were just slowing down death, this is what it would look like. The gap between the two lines wouldn't be the same. And Hopefully, in future three, we will be able to move it out farther and decrease what we die from, right? So, so in the biogerontology uh, field, there's been a lot of argument about whether we li reached the limit of human life expectancy. And if you do an analysis of the survival curves, does everyone know what a survival curve is? It's like, if you live to 60, what's your survival rate? So, a lot of population of 60 years old, what's the chances they're going to die? And it's higher than if they were 20 years old. And as you can see, at around 80, 
the chances that you will be dead is much higher. So when you could draw a curve. And what researchers in this paper have done is they analyzed the shape of the curve and the extension, the scale of the curve. And what they found is the scale effect on the very right, your left, and the shape effect, they've both been going up. So not only have we been squaring the curve by extending our health span, we have been extending lifespan through better health, uh, better nutrition, and better medicines. So the progress is still going on. Japan is leading the world right now. I think Japanese females, they can expect on average to live up to 86 years old. So they're doing much better than us. And it, while life expectancy has a genetic component, there's also a big nutritional component, which I hope to cover in the next couple slides. Next. So this is the current life expectancy, Japan, 86, leading the world. There's some data to show Monaco has nine year old, uh, life expectancy is nine year olds. And the problem with life expectancy in data is that they include infant mortality, car crashes, homicides, and stuff like that, right? So if we can avoid those, we can expect to live even longer than these numbers. Next. Uh, so this is again just trying to determine if you eliminate cancer, ischemic heart disease, stuff like that, you can expect to live around five years more. But I think with what I've researched over the past 10 years, we can expect to live probably 10 years more. I'm pretty sure if you can implement what I've researched, you can live to 100. To live to 120 and break Gene Calment's record, you would have to probably have to implement calorie restriction. But not many people are willing to do that. I'm still not willing to do that. Yes. So 10 years of life, it's a matter of choice. Uh, so they looked at all the components of lifestyle and determined that if you don't smoke, don't drink, have a good cholesterol profile, have the right weight, you can expect to live 10 years longer than the average. So there are things that we can do to extend our life right now. It's much simpler than implementing stem cells or telomerase or stuff like that, right? And what is this? Sorry, I put the slide together yesterday. I haven't slept for 40 hours. <laughs> the ages I definitely was. Now these are just uh, the effects of different healthy lifestyles, vegetarian diets, exercise, nuts and stuff on your lifestyle. So you can expect to live longer. So next. So typically everybody has their own opinion of what healthy lifestyle is, but what does the evidence actually show? And that's what I'm going to cover. Thanks. So in evidence-based nutrition, there's two components. What, to, what not to eat, and then what you should be eating. And I'll first cover what not to eat. So the first thing not to eat is animal products. Based on everything I know, I'm pretty sure a vegetarian diet, a proper vegetarian diet, is probably healthiest. And first I'll cover why animal products are bad for you. There's cholesterol, saturated fat, and persistent organic pollutants. Yep, go on. This is a egg study done on physician health. So they took a group of physicians, split them up into quartiles of how much eggs they ate, and determined whether they were more likely to die of coronary artery disease or anything else, overall mortality. And what they found was there was no difference. So a lot of you probably have been recently reading the paper saying, oh, if you eat like an egg or two a day, it doesn't matter. But that's not true, if you look at the evidence. Go on. Yeah, it doesn't influence CVD risk in male physicians. Next. So in our diet, cholesterol mostly comes from animal products. Eggs, one yolk has 200 milligrams, which is quite a lot, as I'll show you. Go on. So why did that study show that cholesterol had no effect on mortality? I think the reason is because the baseline cholesterol intake of those physicians were already high. If you see, if the baseline cholesterol is 300 milligrams a day, no matter how much cholesterol you add, up to 2,500 milligrams a day, it had no change on your certain cholesterol levels. However, if you had only 100 milligrams levels a day, there is a large change in the amount of cholesterol you add. And if you have zero cholesterol a day, near to a vegetarian diet, every 100 milligrams you add would consistently increase your cholesterol level to a dangerous level. And while people, while most of the studies focus on cholesterol levels, 
what's been shown is that if you feed cholesterol to healthy people, what's next? If you feed cholesterol to healthy people, you have things like CRP and serum amyloid protein that increases. So these are healthy people with normal cholesterol levels. If you feed them cholesterol, they get more inflamed, they get more oxidative stress. So in healthy people, there is an effect, even though it's not shown in serum cholesterol levels. Next. And as you can see, the lipoprotein levels hardly change between the groups. Non-significant. Uh, so I have an analysis guide one, guideline. If you look at life extension research today, there's a bunch of supplements you could take that claim that it extends lifespan in rats. But the problem with these studies is that if you take someone with cancer, you remove the tumor, you do extend their life, but you wouldn't expect to apply that principle to any people who didn't have tumors. Right? If you took a diabetic rat and you fed him something that cured the diabetes, it definitely extends life. Green tea extract, you do the studies in rats, it shows it extends their lifespan. But we don't have diabetes. So why should we be taking green tea extract? Why should we be taking respiratory metformin, or rapamycin, all those drugs? Because it has not proved, been proven to extend life in healthy folks. It's only been proven to extend life in people who are sick. But that doesn't apply to us. So a lot of research today. So to all race deficiency. Uh, I think it was two years ago this paper came out. And it said to long race could extend your lifespan. And it showed that in telomerase deficient mice, telomerase would extend lifespan. But we're not telomerase deficient. And I suspect if we gave ourselves telomerase to use to try and extend our lifespan, it would give us cancer. Because one of the things that stop cancer cells from reproducing is the fact that they're, ex they're able to, well, the thing that stops cancer, the thing that keeps cancer cells from uh, replicating itself is the fact that they have telomerase they can extend the ends of those DNA molecules that keep us from being damaged. So if we were to apply this to healthy people, we would probably all get cancer. Next. So this is in Seventh-day Adventists. They're the group in the United States with one of the longest, with one of the longest life expectancies and also the most centenarians. They're a religious group and one of the rules, some of the rules is exercise every day, don't smoke, don't drink, and don't eat meat, they're a vegetarian group. And as you can see, if you look at relative risk of all-cause mortality, diabetes, coronary heart disease, the more days per week that they consumed meat products, the higher the risk of death. Mm -hmm. And this is a 46-year follow-up study in healthy businessmen, so 46 years. And they found that the more cholesterol you consumed, the more likely you were to die. And so the group that uh, consumed the most cholesterol, greater than nine milligrams per, uh, greater than nine nanomillimoles per day, their mean life years has, has decreased as compared to groups that ate less. So there's a straight line there. There's a linear association there. And we have pretty good evidence today to show that statins, the lower your LDL level due to statins, the lower your risk of coronary artery disease. And uh, Luke mentioned the paleo diet. I was a fan of that a while ago, <laughs> but not anymore. Uh, but if you do look at hunter-gatherers that don't live in the urban environment, their cholesterol levels, this is the adult American cholesterol level right here. And that is the hunter-gatherer cholesterol levels right there. So if we're meant to live in a natural state, our cholesterol levels are 50% less than what they actually are nowadays. If you compare them to wild primates, and wild animals, it's also lower. So it's a sign that we are eating more cholesterol, low, cholesterol than we're meant to eat, and that increase in cholesterol intake is causing coronary RDs, most likely cancer, Alzheimer's, and things related to that. So the other part of animal products is saturated fat. And the reason saturated fat is bad, the reason why the ADA and all the other health organizations says saturated fat is bad is because saturated fats, the black bars, they're the ones most likely to raise our LDL levels. Okay. Monounsaturated fats doesn't do that. Polyunsaturated fat doesn't do that. So if you eat saturated fat, it raises your cholesterol levels more than eating actual cholesterol. That's why everyone says it's so bad for you. Next. 
And the other component of saturated fat is postprandial stress. Now, most of the time when we eat, we have to absorb all those nutrients. The nutrients go through our systems, the mitochondria, creates a flux of nutrients and oxidative stress. And it's after eating that causes the most damage in your body. And in terms of aging, if anyone's read about Aubrey de Grey's work, the reason we age is because we get damaged. An example he likes to use is a car. We, can, we have cars from over 100 years ago that still drive, right? And the only reason that they still drive is because we take out the parts that are broken or we renew the pro parts that aren't working as well. So Aubrey de Grey's working uh, sense is to repair that damage. But my, my whole thing is, if we can't repair the damage right now, we should be able to prevent the damage. And one of the things that causes the most postprandial stress is saturated effects. And the other part is persistent organic pollutants. As you go up the food chain, pollutants get accumulated within the fats of the uh, tissues of the animals and everything. So if you eat those, if you eat animal products, you bioaccumulate all the organic pollutants that are present in the environment. They've accumulated for you and then you accumulate it again. And there's a lot of evidence to show that these persistent organic pollutants are able to cause cancer, diabetes, asthma, stuff like that. So they bioaccumulate in human and animal tissues, and they biomagnify in food chains. We're at the top of the food chain. We accumulate all of this. So if you do choose to continue to eat meat and stuff like that, what's been shown is if you drain all the fat, you decrease the amount of persistent organic pollutants you eat by like 80%. Because most of the ones that are dangerous to us are fat soluble, the ones that stay in our body. The water soluble ones, we can just piss them out. Next. And then there's fish and uh, heavy metals and fish. If you're a big sushi eater, stay away from tuna. Salmon is pretty safe. The safest ones are things like shrimp, tilapia, the ones that don't eat other smaller fish. And the really high ones are like shark and stuff. I don't think they eat any of that. And any other part of the presentation, you don't eat damaged food products. So with aging comes damage. One of the forms of damage is advanced glycation end products. And advanced glycation end products is where most of our, most of the machinery in our cells are made out of proteins. They're made out of enzymes. And these enzymes can be damaged. Once they're damaged, they don't function as well. And so what damages these uh, proteins? What damages these proteins is glucose. And so to avoid forming these advanced glycation end products, you have to decrease your blood sugar levels. And you decrease your blood sugar levels by eating low glycemic index foods, right? Because this process of glycation is a reaction, and reaction speed is proportional to concentration. And it's also exponentially proportional to temperature, but our temperature stays the same. So the only thing that we can affect is concentration. And there's other things like oxidized polyunsaturated fats, burnt foods, and nitrites, which I will cover soon. Yes. So advanced glycation end products. On the right side, you have fresh food. That's, the, that's what our flesh should look like. On your right side, you have products that have been cooked. And the cooking process causes advanced glycation end products. And these advanced glycation end products cause your tissues to look like that. And this is what happens to your skin when it undergoes damage. So this is just a pathway for your interest of how sugar, when it goes through the metabolic pathways, forms these shorter sugar chains, which are reactive ends, and it causes AG formation. So eating sugar is bad, eating starchy foods are bad, anything that causes high blood sugar levels. And one of the forms of damaging diabetes is glycation end products. And so are glycation end products bad for you? What I've been talking about is theoretical stuff. This is actual stuff done in animal studies. I think it's done in rats. So we all know calorie restriction. Well, I'm going to tell you, calorie restriction in rats extend lifespan. If you restrict 40%, they live 40% longer. So the black bars here are calorie restricted mice. As you can see, they live longer than the other groups. Regular is not calorie restricted. So we know calorie restriction extends life. But once we add AGEs, the gray circles, to the diets of calorie-restricted rats, their lifespan decreases even as compared to the controls. 
So it's clear that advanced glycation end products are bad for you. It's not only advanced glycation end products formed inside your body, it's advanced glycation products you consume outside. So there's endogenous and exogenous forms. So the advanced glycation end products outside are due mainly to heat. Cooking your food, cooking meat, baking at high temperatures, dry heat causes advanced glycation end products to form. Because advanced glycation end products is a reaction which is proportional to temperature. So anything that causes an increased temperature causes advanced glycation end product formation. So in this paper, you can go and read it. I'll probably post this somewhere. Uh, it tells you how you can decrease your dietary intake of advanced glycation end products. But the gist of it is don't eat as much burnt food, as much cooked food as you usually eat. Next. So it's just an example, meat products, any animal products, they usually cause a glycation end product because they have all the necessary ingredients. They have glycogen stores that have carbohydrates, they have the protein, which forms the glycation end products, and they have the fats, which form unstable compounds that exacerbate the situation. Vegetable products are usually good. So endogenous and exogenous. Next. And then comes to oxidized polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, so one of the big things nowadays is the consumption of fish oil. Fish oil prevents heart disease, which I'm not convinced it does. But the problem with buying fish oil at the store is it's sitting at room temperature for such a long time. In fish oil, they are very, very long chain fatty acids with multiple double bonds. What these double bonds do is they can uh, extract electrons away from this bis site, then hydrogen can come off forming free radicals. So free radicals can form at all these sites. The more sites of these you have, the more free radicals you can form. And free radical formation is a prop is propagational. It propagates. So once one part of the capsule that you consume that's fish oil has gets broken down because sitting at room temperature for so long, the rest of the fish oil can become contaminated and it can become oxidized. And this is another uh, damaged product that you will consume. And oxidated polyunsaturated fatty acids are really bad because they get put into your cell membranes. Your cell membranes are formed by fatty acids. And if you do have these oxidized, oxidized polyunsaturated fatty acids in your cell membranes, it can cause damage to your mitochondria and genetic material inside the cell. And that's another reason that's another of Aubrey de Grey's reasons for why we age, mitochondrial DNA damage. So if you look at lifespan across animals, if you look at, uh, take a rat and take a bird, they're the same size, they should be able to live the same amount. Uh, the lifespan should be similar, but it's not. The bird lives much, much longer than the rat. And the reason they think is because of the number of polyunsaturated fatty acids in their membranes. The less polyunsaturated fatty acids you have, the longer you live, and the more polyunsaturated unsaturated fatty acids you have, the shorter lifespan you have. So by consuming fish oil, you're overloading your cell membranes with these polyunsaturated fatty acids, theoretically lowering your lifespan. Next. So this is fish oil, as you can see, multiple double bonds, multiple sites to have a hydrogen removed. And the form of omega-3s that I recommend is flaxseed oil. Flaxseed oil is shorter, so there's less sites where it can be removed. And you allow your body to control how much DHA, AHA, uh, that your body needs, right? Because if you consume the governmental recommendation is to consume one gram of fish oil. What if, what if one gram of fish oil is too much? So real quick, alpha lipoic acid is flaxseed oil? No, no. Uh, this is alkalinoleic acid. Oh, so yeah. Same acronym. Okay. But, uh, this is the plant form. This is the animal form. If one gram, yeah, that's fine. Uh, if one gram is too much, you'll be overloading your cells. But if you only take flaxseed oil, you allow your body to as much as it's required, which is the minimum amount. Yep. Um, what I was wondering, since I missed the first part of the um, mm -hmm. talk on fish oil, uh, is if it was kept um, refrigerated, would it be better? Uh, or like, would it retain, would yeah. it not form free radicals, right. which will... Yeah. 
the so is that how you would want to take fish oil if you were going to take fish oil? If the problem with the encapsulation process is, if you look at, if you go to a plant and see how they form these gelatin capsules, it's under heat because oh, the gelatin okay. capsules they need to be liquid so they can form the capsules, right? Mm -hmm. So they go through this machine, there's heat produced, and there's heat applied to yeah. the oil. And not only that, once it's encapsulated, it increases the surface area that the oil is exposed to because these gelatin capsules aren't oxygen impermeable. Right? Okay. The more capsules you have, the more surface area you have. If you were to take fish oil, you would take it in the bottle, liquid. So the only part that's exposed to the air is the top part. Oh, okay. Well, so like not encapsulated, just not pure encapsulated. liquid. Pure liquid. Yeah. It's just kind of <laughs> <laughs> how, how does it, how does it sustain itself to the, to the uh, stomach acids? Well, once it's inside, it doesn't matter. There's not, there's not that much oxygen within your body. But uh, fish oil normally is an entire coated so that it bypasses the stomach. Yeah. Well, if it was un unencapsulated, it would basically. Well, uh, if you look at the research on digestion, it doesn't affect fish, the fish oil. It doesn't need to be entered to code. It's, that's just a marketing for it. And I think that's probably also in part because of what gets digested where, right? Fats and oils don't get digested until later in the system. Right, yeah, but the uh, when they market enterically coated capsules, it's usually because they tell you that the acid degrades the fish oil. The acid degrades DHA, that doesn't happen. Buddhist oil mm -hmm. is the most made by but he does have one that's DHA, mm. but it's not from fish oil, it's from something else. I think it's from an algae. Yeah. And uh, um, how does, do you have you done any research on that? Uh, I used to I used to do some work from the supplement industry with their research. Voodoo's oil, they have a lot of uh, products, but their main products is the three six nine product, right? We already get too much omega six as it is. Right? So there's no need to supplement with six on top of three. And the problem with adding nine to it is our body makes nine. We don't need to supplement nine. It's not essential fat oil. Okay. But we thought wrong with the BHA, mm -hmm. but which is from a vegetarian source, not from fish. But, but it's, yeah, I understand what you're saying. It's still the same form. It's still the same form. Still the same form. Okay. And DHA is the longest when we get through the So it's the most problematic. Okay. So flaxseed oil, as I said, capsules increase surface area. So it increases the uh, amount of oil exposed to oxygen, which increases oxidation. Ensure that the flaxseed oil is stored in the fridge. So if you go to Whole Foods, they have a fridge section where, where they have flaxseed oil in there. And so I recommend you buy that flaxseed oil, you take it home, put it in the freezer. Because this is a has so many unsaturated bonds, it won't freeze solid. It would still be liquid, still in the freezer. And if you keep in the freezer, the degradation rate is slower. So the recommendation is to take one tablespoon a day. If you uh, consider 8% conversion rate in the average human being, that gives you enough bond chains, polyunsaturated fatty acids to satisfy your requirements. Next. Okay, next. I'm not to eat, I cover that. What to eat? So, there are, there are some foods in the scientific literature that has very, very good evidence to support its consumption. So real olive oil, broccoli and vegetables, wine, green tea in the Japanese, there's really good prospective evidence to show that it extend, uh, extends life. Blueberries, hazelnuts, and I'll cover supplements at the end. So why do I put real in front of olive oil? I think I have a slide on it next. Olive oil next. Right, so real olive oil. And if you, there's a, there was an article in the New Yorker a couple years ago by Tom Mueller, and he was talking about the olive oil business. Now, if you think about olive oil, tons of people all over the world consume olive oil, but all of, real olive oil only comes from Mediterranean countries in California, right? Is there enough olive oil in the world to supply everyone that consumes it? No. And if you look at research on olive oil, most of it you buy and store is fake. It's been adulterated. They add hazelnut oil, they add soybean oil to dilute it. And since hazelnut and soybean oil isn't green in color, they add chlorophyll to make it green. 
right? So most of the stuff that you buy in stores is not real olive oil. If you get it tested, it's been diluted, it's had stuff added to it, so you're not getting the real beneficial effects of real olive oil. And so in terms of the beneficial, I'll tell you where to get real olive oil later. Uh, that was like a three year process, it was really painful. <laughs> uh, so the research with olive oil, so as you can see here, olive oil intake, and uh, this is overall mortality, so your overall chance of die, dying. The more olive oil you eat, the less of the chance you have of dying. And this has been repeated over and over and over again. And so if you look at what component of olive oil is beneficial, it's a phenolic component, the uh, polyphenols that you always hear about. And so in this study, they looked at the entire literature to see what effect the olive oil phenolics have on your body. So any decreases platelet uh, function, decreasing atherosclerosis, gives you better cholesterol levels, increases bone formation, decreases oxidative stress, things like that. So it does a lot of good things for you. Next. And so this is a test by uh, the olive oil organization in California. So next. As you can see, virgin, these yellow bolded signs, these are products that claim to be extra virgin olive oil. And as you can see, most of them fail. Most of them are not extra virgin olive oil. They've all either been kept at room temperature for too long, or they've had hazelnut oil or so soybean oil added to it to dilute it. Next. And it, as you can see, it's really important to get fresh olive oil. Because the longer you keep it in storage, the, deep, uh, the, more, the less poly polyphenols you get. So by the time one year, which is usually around how long it's been sitting on the store shelves, 60% of the polyphenols are gone. Uh, this is a Tom Mueller article. It's a multi-fraudulent olive oil is a multi-billion dollar industry in the world. It makes just as much as the cocaine <laughs> industry. So people who fake stuff. Yeah. Profits were comparable to co cocaine trafficking, but none of the risk because no one suspects it, right? If you cook it, yeah, it gets that's the polyphenols die. Oh, okay. yeah. Polyphenols, they're antioxidants outside of the body. Inside of the body, we don't know what it does, but outside of the body, it's antioxidants. You apply heat, the reaction process destroys it all. So the next thing you should be eating is cruciferous vegetables, broccoli. Out of all the vegetables that we consume, broccoli has the best research behind it. And over the past two decades, the research in broccoli has been equivocal. Some have shown that broccoli doesn't reduce cancer, doesn't recruit, uh, reduce overall mortality, while some of the research shows that it does. And I think the problem is, one, genetics. So in here, isothiocyanates is the beneficial component of broccoli. And in a study in China, they found that if they found this product in your urine, you are less likely to die of heart disease or cancer. And one of the problems here is M1T1, which is a polymorphism, which is uh, an enzyme in your liver that can degrades isothiocyanates. Right? So if you're lucky enough to have the polymorphism that doesn't, you can eat broccoli and expect to uh, prevent cancer. Next. And again, same thing, it prevents colorectal cancer. It prevents every form of cancer, as far as I can see. Next. Breast cancer. Next. Right, so the, the thing with broccoli and why I think there's been equivocal studies is glucosinolates is what's found in the raw vegetable. Once you chew it up, myrosinase, which is found in the cell wall, gets released. Myrosinase is the enzyme that converts glucosinolates into isothiocyanates. This is a beneficial component. Now, the problem with myrosinase is at around 40 degrees te uh, Celsius, it gets denatured. It doesn't work anymore. So in these studies, what I found is that if they included studies that doesn't specify eating raw broccoli, they found no effect. And it's because once you cook it, you don't get the beneficial component of it anymore. So what you should be eating is 
raw barbecue, raw cauliflower, right? raw bok choy. If you cook it, if you steam it, or go above 40 degrees Celsius, you don't get any of the beneficial effects. So why eat it? So this is the effect of cooking. Next. What they found is uh, if you cook it, my rosinase process goes down. Any question on that? Do you do you recommend organic? Yeah, organic versus conventional. Uh, I mean, okay, organic's really expensive, right? And they say organic on the label, and the USDA has policies with regards to what's organic or not. But the thing is, it doesn't say pesticide free. It's not pesticide free. You can't grow vegetables nowadays without pesticides. And so for you to consider organic vegetables to be healthier than conventional vegetables, you have to show me that uh, organic pesticides are less dangerous than conventional pesticides. And that hasn't been shown. And if you want to think about the nutrition component of it, there's been no difference in the studies between conventional vegetables and organic vegetables. There's no difference in nutrients. You, you, the only reason you find differences in nutrients is because of the pesticide used by the organic people. The organic people pesticides have more copper, have more mag manganese. So when you test it, they come back higher with these minerals. Okay? But in reality, if you were to get rid of the pesticide, there's no difference between the two. No? Yeah. Okay. So for um, in the dietetics literature, I come across some discussion of cooking changing the nutritional profile of the foods. One, uh, for instance, uh, being yeah. Yeah, beta carotene. carrots. So the only thing that you sh should cook that's a vegetable is to get carotenoids out of cells. And the reason that you have to cook these is because carotenoids are found in the cell wall. You can't digest open the cell wall, but you can cook it open. And by cooking, you degrade the cell wall, you can absorb those carotenoids. Okay. So, so things like tomatoes, lycopene, carrots, green pepper, uh, red peppers, yellow peppers, things like that. You should cook those. Okay, uh, I'm gonna list one more time. It's uh, red pepper. Anything with like anything, color. Anything with color, right? Yep. Up until last year, I was working towards becoming a raw vegan. Right. And then my naturopath told me that people over the age of 27 mm. have much more difficulty assimilating raw food mm. and digesting it. Mm and getting the nutrients out of it right. than out of cooked food. Now, right. what is your opinion on that? Uh, I don't think it's true. Because I thought that eating raw food, you get the enzymes to digest the food. Uh, with the enzymes, there's no research to show there's beneficial enzymes in vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of absorbing nutrients in older, as you get older, you keep, the only research I've seen is your ability to assimilate proteins. But other than that, there's been no research to show that you have a decreased ability to assimilate vitamins and minerals. Because vitamins and minerals are a necess necessity for life, right? right. So we've developed pretty good systems to absorb these uh, vitamins and minerals. Yeah. I wanted to ask you the organics question with regards to meat products. Do organic uh, products have fewer uh, pollutants? Yeah, uh, I don't eat meat, so it's not a big deal for me. But yes, organic products do have this. Uh, they have less growth hormone and antibiotics and uh, estrogenic compounds in them. But in terms of pesticides, it would be pretty similar. The only difference would be like pigs. Sometimes on farms they feed pigs other animal products, right? So they become biomagnified within the pigs and they eat pigs. While at organic farms, they, don't, they do not feed pigs meat products. So that would be the only difference. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so, and those things are, are you think, negative for, for lifespan, the, yeah. the hormones yeah, and the, hormones the biotics? Are negative. Yeah. The hormones are negative, sorry, the hormones are negative for lifespan because of the issue of cancer. We all have cancer cells in our body. If you look at the literature, people who die when they're 30, 40 years old, for males, if you look at the prostate, they have cancer cells in there. It's just most of the time our bodies are able to fight it off, right? But if you supply them with something like growth hormone, estrogenic compounds, testosterone compounds, you give them a boost to their growth. And theoretically, you could push them over the limit of what your body's capable of compensating for. 
and we get cancer. Uh, I'll go first and I'll get back to you. Uh, um, not that I'm a mediator, but just the mm -hmm. mediators in the room. Uh, the last group, I guess, being uh, food that you hunt. Uh, mm -hmm. Is meat that you hunt any healthier? Oh. Uh, I don't think there's any research on that issue, but. No? Yeah. Can we try to save the rest of the questions till the end? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, just one more. Uh, well, I was just wondering if, because my understanding was that uh, things like growth hormone mm -hmm. and estrogen and compounds mm -hmm. generally didn't survive in the stomach environment. So, is it perhaps cancers like sort of you know micro cancers that are developing in the esophagus and right. such that might be sort of the worst? Well, uh, the concerns there with with exogenous ex exogenic uh, growth hormone and such. The like estrogenic compounds like soy protein. It does survive, and it does okay. have it does have enough affecting women and also men, right? So it does survive the acid environment. Okay. So it's not completely degraded. Growth hormone as well. Growth hormone as well. Okay. Because uh, it's not like the normal growth hormone molecule in a human. It's like our our BGH or something like that. Those things, for some reason, they survive. But most most like testosterone. Methylated. Testosterone. Uh, Testosterone is a cholesterol molecule, so it would survive. And, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure what the end effects of these are, but I'm sure there are effects. Mm -hmm. And the methylation would be taken care of by your liver, mm -hmm. probably. So that's how people used to sneak it in through yeah. the stomach, right? Methylize it, so yeah. it gets it through your liver. Yeah. So the other beneficial component is alcohol and red wine. Yes. So this is a meta analysis, huge meta analysis done. There's a J-shaped curve. You commonly, uh, you commonly see this in everything that's related to human beings. So, the, so for around one to two drinks a day is where mortality is lowest. So as you can see, people who drink have lower mortality than people who don't drink. Right? And but the more that you drink, the higher your chance of dying becomes. <laughs> so up here is a binge drinkers and alcoholics. Right? It makes sense. But I suspect that if you could increase the polyphenol intake, the curve would continue to go downwards. The increase in mortality effects is due to the alcohol, not the polyphenols in the red wine. Right. And uh, back on. Uh, this part, there's been some criticism about the sick quitters hypothesis. It's like people who used to binge drink, they quit. And once they take the survey, they say they consume zero drinks. So they get lumped into this group. Right? So in reality, then this group is not actually beneficial. But if you look at how the studies are done, they do stratified analysis to show that even if you included these sick quitters, the effect's still present. And if you look at the questionnaires, how they ask them, have you been a binge drinker before? Did you used to be an alcoholic? Usually they're, they try their best to exclude them. Right? So I don't think the sick quitter hypothesis stands. And there's, Research to show how alcohol and polyphenols and red wine can be beneficial. So when mechanism and research they come together, it just makes sense. Next, uh, this is uh, the pattern of alcohol intake. So in Belfast, they're binge drinkers. In France, they tend to drink on them like with their meals. Right, so they're more consistent. So what's been shown is. If you're more consistent with your drinking, your mortality is lower than if you binge drink. Mm -hmm. So the role of drinking pattern and type of alcohol, which is what I just covered. Uh, the only thing, there's no research to support this yet, but I suspect that if you were to drink alcohol with meals, it would decrease your postprandial stress because of the polyphenols. So if you were to take on drinking red wine, I would suspect just that you drink them with meals. Okay, well, thanks. All right, so there's a zoot fence study. I think a lo really long-term follow-up. So like 40 years or so. And what they found was people that drank wine, this is a prospective study. People who drank wine, their overall mortality was lower. survival curve. So wine use is a black line. Beer and spirit use, like hard liquor, also extend the lifespan. 
and that's because alcohol does have a beneficial mechanism. But red wine extends life even more because it not only has alcohol, but it has the polyphenols within it. Uh, Centra green tea. So most of the green tea research comes from Japan. It's been found that the more green tea you consume, the less your mortality rate. So one to three, 0.97, not significant, but once over seven, you decrease your uh, all cars mortality by 30%, which is pretty significant. So it decreases cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all cars. Greater than five cups, 20% decrease. And, yeah. So a lot of these foods that I'm talking about, a big component of their benefit is polyphenols. The polyphenols are the things that give vegetables their taste, their bitter taste, sometimes their sweet taste. And in a meta analysis done from a cohort in the US, the higher your total flavonoid intake, the uh, lower your mortality rate. Now, the confidence interval up here gets really big because the current research on vegetable intake, the polyphenol content of it isn't exactly exact. So once you get beyond 500 uh, units of flavonoid intake, the data becomes very inaccurate. So that's why you have that. And then nuts. Uh, in the Alameda and Seven Adventist group, one big component that they determined for their, uh, from their lifestyle is the consumption of nuts. The more nuts, like, the more nuts someone in that group consumed, the longer their life expectancy. So my recommendation is to consume only hazelnuts. And the reason for that uh, recommendation is because hazelnuts, saturated fat is lowest as compared to other ones, and also the polyunsaturated fat, satur uh, fatty acids is lowest. 7.9 compared to almonds, which is 12.2. The reason I want polyunsaturated fatty acids to be low is most of the time when you buy nuts, they're roasted or they're baked or something like that. And if you have polyunsaturated fatty acid, the problem comes back of oxidation. Okay. So hazelnuts is the most stable. Macadamia nuts is my foremost recommendation, but they're damn expensive. <laughs> hazelnuts is okay. And also hazelnuts have healthy phytochemicals. They're pretty high in those. Uh, and then other things, tomatoes, like a thing you cook love. Orange peels. Uh, I don't expect most of you to eat orange peels. I eat orange peels. And the healthy thing in orange peels is limonene. And limonene right now is going through clinical trials for the prevention of breast cancer. It's in phase three now, so it's past phase one and two. And the reason limonene is works well for fighting cancer is probably because it's fat soluble. So you consume it, you go inside the body, and it gets stored in your fat. And it's there to fight any cancer that comes along in the future. And then the other thing is garlic. It has allicin. Uh, if you don't want to eat garlic, that's fine. The research on garlic isn't that convincing. But coffee, yeah. there's a lot of research coming in. <laughs> but coffee, there's a lot of recent evidence coming out that it does decrease overall mortality. And I find that surprising considering the fact that if you look at people who drink coffee, they put a bunch of crap in there. Yet, if you look at their overall, mor overall mortality over 10 years, it's decreased. So there must be something in coffee that's counteracting the excess sugar they're putting in there, the fat from the cream and stuff like that. And organic versus conventional uh, vegetables. I use this to clean all my vegetables. While there are water-soluble pesticides that you can just wash off with water, there's hydrophobic pesticides that get stuck onto the vegetables. And the only way you can lift them off the surface of the vegetable is if you used uh, detergent. And this is an uh, all-natural detergent you can get at Whole Foods. You just put it in the water, soak the vegetables, and lift off the hydrophobic pesticides. As I said, there's no nutritional difference, and while you I, would, I feel good that I can get the external hydrophobic pesticides on. There are internal hydrophobic pesticides. It does get absorbed by the vegetables, and that can't be removed. So you are still consuming pesticides. But it's 
the internal pesticides are much worse than if you consume their own products. So lesser of evils. And this is just a list of the fruits and vegetables with the highest pesticides mentioned. So things like spinach, uh, you have to wash really well, apples, grapefruits, cherries. Most of the time when you eat fruit, you should peel off the peel. So like with apples, you either wash them really, really well or take off the peel. Next. And then just leading you up to a supplement there. Do I have more time? Um, we're pretty much past. Okay. Yeah, we can put more things in this. Uh, if you guys want to stop or go on. Yeah, we can just take a break first. Um, the only thing that's left is the supplement part. Keep going. Yeah, let's do the presentation. Let's do it. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> supplements. A lot of people think that if you don't eat vegetables, you could just supplement. If you don't eat this, you can just supplement with that. The problem is the extract from the actual food isn't the same as if you actually ate the food. Because to extract the food, they have to either use water-soluble solvents or lipophilic solvents to extract a certain component of the food. So it's not exactly the same. And it's also not in its natural matrix. So once your body digests it, it's to it could be totally different than what it was originally meant to be. So if you do extract with lipophilic elements, which a lot of supplements do, not only do you have chemical solvent residue left over in the pill, the temperature required changes the substance and it can distort all the other parts of the pill. And the problem is if you extract it, it's not inside the matrix. If you look at broccoli, it has a structure to it. And that structure protects all the components <coughs> inside the broccoli. Once you extract it, you remove the structure so it's unstable and it's not digested the same way. So it doesn't have the same effect. Right? So it's best to eat actual food. So this is just a process. Grape seed extract. Extract it through water, which sometimes requires heat, and then they freeze dry it into this grape seed extract. And it's not the same because you don't have the seed. You don't have the matrix to help support it. And stability, if you look at delimonene, once you leave it outside in the air, it creates allergens. And it becomes an allergen because it's being oxidized. It's not stable anymore. The fiber in the orange peel is not there to support it. Next. So this is a very basic supplement regimen. Everyone should be supplementing vitamin D. If you go online and look at the research, Everyone's recommending you supplement vitamin D. The only issue is the Canadian Health Agency recommends 4,000 IUs as the top limit, while the American government recommends 2,000 IUs. But people's serum levels vary widely. So for some people, 1,000 IUs, you can reach 30 to 40 easily, while other people require 5,000. So if the person who took 1,000 required 1,000, took 5,000, they're blood levels could be at like 70 or 80 nanograms per milliliter, which is much too high, way too high. So the best thing to do would be to get a vitamin D supplement, start at 2,000 units, take it, and then get a vitamin D blood test. So to get a vitamin D blood test, you have to go to your doctor, ask for it, and you have to probably pay for it nowadays. Or you can go up to the vitamin D council and you can order a kit. You know, maybe you a kit, take your, uh, poke, poke some blood, put it on a piece of paper, and then send it back, and they'll give you a vitamin D. Is it is there there is a difference between um, uh, pill absorption and skin absorption? Is there not a problem with the uh, uh, with um, you absorb the vitamin D too much? No. Yeah. Um, I think I go over these next. I go back. So vitamin K two. Pretty sure I go over them. Yeah, I do. Okay, next. Okay, so optimal nutrition aims triage theory. Next. So low micronutrient intake may accelerate the degenerative diseases of aging. And it makes sense because you have a lot of systems in your body that require nutrients. If you don't have enough nutrients to support that system, things like antioxidant processes or repair processes can't go on. Right? So which causes excess wear and tear. 
So it's best to get your RDA of all your nutrients. Next. And next. So these are the recommendations currently for all these nutrients. Next. And you can get them by going to the site, Chronometer. If you input everything that you eat, it'll tell you whether you reach the targets for vitamins and minerals. And so this is my diet, 2,000 calories a day. I've been doing this for like 10 years. Next. And as you can see, most, for most nutrients, I reach a target limit. Some, some excessive, but this vitamin A is not actual plant, uh, animal form, retinol vitamin A. It's more like carotenoids, like beta carotene, stuff like that, which doesn't do that much harm. Right. And this is the vitamin D levels. As you can see, low vitamin D levels, mortality, and it curves upwards. The higher your vitamin D levels, also the more chance of you dying. So the optimal portion is 30 to 40 nanograms per milliliter. Yep. Are you getting that much vitamin K through broccoli or through kale? Uh, broccoli, vegetables. But I think I'll discuss it later. Next. So yeah, right now it's all about upper limit 4,000 IU, but I think that should be changed. And it probably will in the coming years when more research shows that high vitamin D levels is bad for calcification or pancreatic cancer, stuff like that. And ORAC. Who's heard of ORAC? Yeah. Uh, it's crap. <laughs> because ORAC. It's a test tube measure of antioxidant uh, potential of certain nutrients. And because of the test tube value, value, it's in vitro. But the problem with these polyphenols, these antioxidants, once you eat them, they get broken down. Your liver detoxifies them. They never get into the bloodstream. So they never become antioxidants inside the blood. The beneficial parts of phytonutrients is not that they're an antioxidant is that they have a hormetic effect on your body. Yes. So consumption of flavonoid-rich foods, they found that if you eat apples, it increases your antioxidant status, right? But the increasing antioxidant status wasn't due to the polyphenols in the apple. It was due to the vitamin C, one, and two, the fructose. Because as you metabolize fructose, you increase uric acid inside your body, which is an antioxidant. So, the polyphenols never got in there, never had an effect on your antioxidant status overall. So ORAC isn't a good measure of anything that has to do with human health. Yes. So a large increase uh, due to uric acid levels, not the flavonoids themselves. So vitamin K2, yes. So this is a plant form. If you eat tons of broccoli, you get that. This is the animal form. There's a lot of research nowadays to show that this animal form is the form we actually use. And it has, actually has benefits in calcification of your arteries and cancer that vitamin K1, the plant for, doesn't have. And the only way you can get this form is through eating liver, bone marrow, stuff like that. So I don't eat that stuff, so it's best to supplement it. Next. So the human conversion of plant form to animal form is very complicated and probably non-existent. But it does, the reason that the government recommends vitamin K1 is because Vitamin K1 works with coagulation. And coagulation is the only thing that they've measured. They haven't measured things like cardiovascular status or cancer status. Yeah, so if you look at arterial calcification, things that lead to heart attacks, it's the animal form that decreases calcification, not the plant form. So right now there's clinical trials done on the, plant, uh, the animal form for prevention of cancer, I think these are prevention of cancer, and aortic valve calcification. And menaquinol is the animal form, decreases cardiac risk. Next. 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 Okay, lithium. So lithium, I saw the with lithium, which is surprising the most because it's usually considered an antidepressant drug, but there's a lot of evidence to show that this is from Japan, uh, 13, 18 prefectures. The higher your lithium intake, the less your suicide risk. Now, next. So, very low but very long lithium exposure can enhance neurotrophic growth factors. And very low. 
for uh, mag depressive, you would give 300 milligrams of lithium. But for natural intake, found in water, found in food, it's usually around one milligram. So it's much, much lower than what we would give to uh, depressed people. Next. So lithium in drinking water, this is done in Texas, I think. And they found that in mental hospitals near drinking water that had higher amounts of lithium, they had less emissions. And so it has a significant effect on your mood. And this is just uh, the lithium levels across Texas. So there is variation, so what you had enough to do is that. Next. And these are all the uh, things that lithium can affect, cellular resilience. So I suspect that lithium, if you do supplement it long enough, could probably prevent Alzheimer's. And neurosynaptic plasticity, stuff like that. Next. I think it's almost done. Right. And the problem with vegetarian diets is it's missing a lot of nutrients. Now we all hear about zinc, um, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin B12, stuff like that. Well, there's other things in, uh, in meat products that no one else mentions, like taurine, carnitine, creatine, carnosine. All these are only found in meat products, and they all have beneficial effects in the human body. Thanks. So you have to supplement them. So these are reference values for uh, creatine and carnitine. If you look in vegetarians, carnitine, I'll call it carnitine, 44.9. Well, in the reference population, which is omnivorous, 63.5. So we're definitely, if you are a vegetarian, you're definitely deficient in these nutrients. Next. And if you look at vegetarians compared to a Western mixed out, plasma, uh, advanced glycation end products in vegetarians were higher. It's because they do not have these beneficial nutrients to protect themselves. So next. So CML is one of the most commonly measured advanced vacation end products. This is a normal diet, vegetarian diet. It's higher. And so taurine is one of the uh, cardi nutrients that you do not get if you eat a complete vegetarian diet. And there's a lot of good mechanistic evidence to show that it helps regulate blood pressure, prevents coronary artery disease access an antioxidant within the mitochondria. Next. Yeah. Anti-inflammatory. Uh, this is carnitine. Not important. Next. Yeah. Oh, this is acetyl carnitine of lipoic acid. You were mentioning alpha lipoic acid before. Uh, so four month old. I don't remember what they did. I think they traumatized the brain in animals that are fed acetyl carnitine, which is one of the uh, cardi nutrients. And in the group that will supplement with cardi nutrients, the amount of damage done was much less than if you weren't supplemented with cardi nutrients. So it has a perfect type of effect. Yeah. Are you taking carnitine? Yes, I'm taking carnitine. Not lipoic acid, but carnitine. You don't take them together? No. Is there a reason why? Yes. But <laughs> so I can tell you later. Yeah, sorry, where do you source your carnitine? Like where to buy it? Uh, the one I trust right now is Gerald's formula. I put, I buy most of my supplements online. I'll show you. Oh, okay. it's, it's illegal in Canada. I know. I was say that. But you can buy it over the counter at the pharmacy. Yeah. It's also it's also in uh, like Animal Pack by New Universal Nutrition. Oh, really? They see yeah. carnitine. How many times do they take it? Uh, the normal omnivorous diet gets around 125 milligrams, so I take a 250 milligram pill. Once a day. Once a day. Next. So creatine, vegetarians don't get creatine found in animal products. You might have heard the study before, vegetarians who supplemented with creatine could think better. So in test of intelligence and thinking capacity, it increased after creatine intake. Next, it probably increased because it was found in, by supplementing creatine, you increase the amount of creatine in the human brain, which is used for energetic processes. Next. And Again, this is a brain damage one. If you supplement with the creatine and you damage the brain, the amount of cortex that's damaged is less. So creatine has a protective effect. If you're completely vegetarian, you're missing out on the beneficial component of creatine. And then there's carnosine, which is also found in meat, and it has all these protective factors that you don't get if you're a purely vegetarian diet. Next. And the way you increase carnosine is by dosing beta-alanine. Beta-alanine is a precursor, 
And the other yeah. element name is commonly available at stores. And I get my supplements from iHerb.com. And if you want to use my code, I get some money. You get $5 off. And the other thing, if you want real olive oil, there's a new store that opened up, sourced by Veronica Foods, one of the largest distributors of olive oil in the world. They have a company called Vancouver Olive Oil Company. It's on Broadway. And if you walk in there, ask for the highest polyphenol olive oil, the store uh, manager will point you to the right one. That's it. One question. Okay. <laughs> uh, is there a general consensus in the medical community that, uh, in general, meat products are bad for you? The, the, the problem with getting advice from the medical community is they don't study nutrition. Right? So, I mean, yeah, they don't study nutrition, they want to know. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my doctor. Well, I asked him about this kind of stuff. He recommends eating like beef, uh, lots of bread and beef, and like, uh, mm -hmm. he's of an older generation, so right. I'm assuming maybe like he hasn't done enough research. But like, I'm not trying to like, say that he's the a thing quack. Is, the thing is, none of them have done research oh, okay. in the field. They, so the thing about nutrition, it's a very personal thing, right? And for some people, it could become like at the level of religion, now, right? it's because it's something that you practice every day, and what and you want to know what you put in your body is good. So there's a lot of bias involved. So if you don't do the research, you have a lot of beliefs about nutrition and crap that you could say to other people, right? But it's just not true because they haven't done the research. Right. I, I, I mean, all of that, there are three main major dietetic associations in the world who have yeah. looked at this question, the Emergency Association of Dietetic Physicians, yeah. Dietitians of Canada, mm -hmm. and the ADA. Yeah. And I believe that they have come down on uh, vegetarian diets being uh, more healthy, being more healthy. healthy in, in general. Yeah. If they're properly balanced, they're healthy. Yeah, properly balanced, yeah. and the one thing they're all missing is the cardiomyocytes. Right, and like this, this research, it's been there since the 1930s, but it's been popping along. No one's been focused on it. Should but in the future, we were supposed to your heart on it. Yeah, yeah. 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 The China study, he said that. People like who a eat less than 5% meat mm -hmm. have a longer lifespan. So if you ate up to 5% meat, you would get these nutrients, wouldn't you? Uh, not enough. The, not problem, enough. the problem with the China study is it's a cross-cultural study. And cross-cultural studies don't tell you anything. Because if you look at Japan versus Canada, Japan people live longer, they're healthier, they have less heart disease. But they also play more ping pong, they smoke more. So does that mean we should be playing more ping pong and smoking more? It doesn't, right? You, you, because it's not a homogeneous population, you can't compare what they do. You can only compare within populations. Because within populations, on average, we all don't play ping pong and don't smoke that. So the research is much more accurate in that sense. Well, thank you so much, Hansa. I've seen quite a few presentations. I've seen Bruce Ames speak, and I don't think I've seen anybody there's something that's right on what we want to what we want to know is this today and so it's kind of very